Uh, dear colleagues, uh, today, uh, it is my pleasure to open the IEA's uh, workshop on gas supply security, which aims to provide an assessment of the uh, long-lasting impact of the global gas crisis uh, triggered in uh, 2022 and identify uh, policy options to mitigate risks and uncertainties weighing on the uh, gas uh, supply security. The historic context uh, cannot be ignored. So besides the human tragedy and suffering uh, it is causing, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia profoundly transformed the European and global gas markets. Uh, while the uh, immediate effects of last year's supply, sh supply shock have eased since the beginning of this year, the structural changes which emerged in 2022 will persist for years and should be carefully assessed both by policymakers and market participants, market players. Uh, in this context, the architecture of global gas supply security and the underlying uh, flexibility mechanisms uh, need to be reassessed uh, throughout an e ever closer dialogue between the responsible producers and consumers. The International Energy Agency uh, reacted swift, swiftly uh, to the unfolding uh, the energy crisis. The agency coordinated uh, two emergency oil stock releases, uh, fourth and fifth in its history, and uh, published a series of uh, special reports to provide advice to policymakers on how to mitigate impacts on gas market and reduce reliance on Russian uh, natural gas. IEA also started the Task Force on Gas and Clean Fields Market Monitoring and Supply Security. In February of this year, uh, the IEA hosted a special ministerial on natural gas markets and supply security. Uh, 40 government uh, took part in the meeting to discuss how to foster gas supply security and uh, they highlighting the need for structural gas demand reduction and enhanced dialogue between consumers and responsible gas producers. In July, uh, Japan's METI, Minister of Economy, Trade and Industry, in cooperation with us, IEA, hosted the LNG Producer Consumer Conference uh, to promote dialogue uh, on gas supply security and the mitigation of methane emissions along the uh, LNG value chains. The International Energy Agency, IEA, will continue to lead on energy and gas supply security. So today's workshop, organized with the kind support of uh, Japan's uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, provides a special focus on Asia and its fast-growing markets, where the natural gas is closely linked to policies aiming to phase out uh, coal-fired power generation. So uh, thank you uh, for your participation. And uh, I look forward to active and uh, productive uh, discussion today. Thank you for your attention. Uh, first of all, oh, oh, I'd like to extend my sincere ap uh, appreciation to the IEA for their special efforts in organizing uh, this you know, uh, wonderful uh, opportunity uh, for uh, the uh, workshop. I also would like to thank all the uh, speakers and the audience uh, who are participating today. Uh, last year, the natural gas market experienced significant vi uh, volatility uh, during the energy crisis triggered by uh, Russia's aggression in Ukraine. It affected not only the European market, but also the global gas market, including the Asian market. While uh, decarbonization efforts are uh, accelerated globally, natural gas will continue to be necessary for the stable transition to clean energy. Particularly, it will uh, play an important role in Asian region. Under these circumstances, it is timely that the IEA is hosting this webinar focusing on the importance of natural gas supply security for the green energy transition. The government of Japan is happy to support this uh, webinar financially. 
Japan uh, em uh, emphasizes the uh, uh, perspective of energy uh, access, believing that access to uh, affordable energy forms the basis of people's uh, uh, lives. In addition to the uh, introduction of the uh, renewable energy, Japan believes that it is necessary to diversify sources of crude oil and the natural gas supply, promote uh, investment in upstream de development, and utilize all appropriate energy sources and technologies, including hydrogen, ammonia, renewable energy, and the further use of nuclear power. In particular, natural gas has important role as a transition fuel. It, if the supply demand balance becomes tight due to the future shortage of natural gas, not only will the uh, energy transition toward carbon uh, neutrality in the world, especially in Asia, be stalled, but uh, energy security will also be jeopardized. Security of natural gas supply is important for uh, promoting energy security and the stable energy transition in the world and Asia. At the G7 Hiroshima summit, G7 countries confirmed that they will pursue the same goal of net zero energy consumption and the several paths utilizing all technologies and energy sources according to each country's circumstances so as not to impede uh, economic growth. With, gro uh, with regard to natural gas, G7 emphasizes, emphasized the important role of increasing the new, uh, supply of uh, LNG and confirmed that investment in the gas sector uh, could be appropriate to address the current crisis and the future shortages in the gas market caused by the, this crisis. We look forward to an in, in, informative and lively discussion during today's webinar on the challenges faced, measures taken, and the experiences of governments and the private sector to achieve the uh, common goal of natural gas supply security and the market stability. Well, thank you very much for your attention and uh, I hope you have a good discussion today. Thank you very much, Mr. Katahira. Maybe I should take over from here for the first session. Um, my name is Dennis Hesseling. I'm heading the Gas, Coal and Power Markets Division at the IEA. And I'll be your chair for the first session, which deals with global gas supply and security. And indeed, we're very grateful for the Japanese uh, ministry to support this webinar on um, gas security supply with a focus on Asia. Now, for this uh, first session, we have four speakers. I'm very happy to have them here in this uh, session. The first one to speak will be my colleague, uh, Gergen Molnar. He is a gas analyst in LinkedIn and his uh, very informative posts there. And he will speak about, he will set the scene basically towards a global, uh, a new global gas market. After him will come Andrew Walker. Um, he's the vice president for strategy and communication at Chenier. And he will deal with the outlook for US LNG flexibility and supply security. Then we'll have Tatiana Mitrova, who is not only research fellow at the Center of Global Energy Policy, but also the founder of New Energy Advancement Hub. And she will deal with the outlook for Russian gas and energy. And then finally, in this session, the fourth speaker will be Maciej Cisiewski, who is Deputy Head of Unit at DGNR, DG Energy uh, at the European Commission. And he will speak about uh, enhancing gas supply security in the European Union. We have about an hour and a half for this session. Um, I would ask each of the speakers to speak for around 15 minutes, quarter of an hour. And then we'll have, after that, about 20 minutes left for the Q&A. With that, um, I hope we can now uh, start, and I will hand over to my colleague, uh, Greg. Many thanks, um, Dennis. Um, dear colleagues, um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, depending um, on from where you are joining us today. My name is Gergely Molnar, and in 
I'm a gas analyst at the International Energy Agency, and and in today's presentation, we really would like um, to set the scene ahead of the discussion um, of today on the different supply security issues, challenges, uh, which are emerging with this new global um, gas market. And this uh, slide is really our starting point, uh, providing a look back to the um, gas supply shock of 2022, when Russia's pipe gas deliveries to Europe uh, halved, translating into a drop of 80 BCM in absolute terms, which roughly equates to 15% of global LNG trade. Um, and this, of course, um, drove up natural gas prices both in Asia and Europe to record highs, led to a reconfiguration of uh, global LNG flows and necessitated a readjustment in natural gas demand, especially in the large import markets of Asia and Europe. The growing flexibility and liquidity of the global LNG market was um, really crucial in the response to the 2022 um, gas supply shock. And on this slide, we are showing the implications on global LNG trade. Europe's LNG imports surged by around 60% or 65 BCM in absolute terms. This was more than double of the increase in global LNG supply. And as such, it necessitated the reshuffling of LNG flows away from other import markets towards the European shores. And we clearly see on this slide the very important role played by the Asian market in that picture. Asia's LNG imports declined by about 7% in 2022, primarily driven by the lower inflows into China, which saw its LNG procurements dropping by about 20%. Now, without this strong LNG inflow, the European market would have been in a significantly um, more vulnerable uh, state in 2022, and um, gas supply disruptions would not have been uh, excluded. Now, this being said, more price sensitive markets uh, with a large exposure to spot um, LNG, especially in Southeast Asia, have seen a steady deterioration of their gas and electricity supply security with both Bangladesh and Pakistan recording rotating power cuts amidst the inadequacy of gas supplies. This slide gives us an overview of the price roller coaster in which we have been um, living in the last two years. Following the steep increase in natural gas prices in 2022, uh, gas market tensions have gradually moderated in uh, 2023. Um, due to a combination of timely policy action, effectively working market forces, and favorable weather conditions. Asian and European uh, gas prices are now trading about 80% below their all-time highs recorded in the summer of 2022. But this being said, they remain well above, um, about two to three times above their historic averages. And if we look at the green line at the bottom of this slide, we also see that European um, gas prices are still about five times higher than US gas prices, which raises a number of question marks around the cost competitiveness and the long-term future of European gas intensive industry. But I think it is also important to highlight that the demand side was really the key driving force behind the easing of market fundamentals in 2023. On this slide, we are showing how natural gas consumption evolved in the major import markets over the last uh, three quarters in 2023. In Europe, natural gas demand uh, declined by around 9% or 33 BCM, and this has been really driven by all end user sectors. In addition, um, European storage injection needs were about 20 BCM lower than in 2022 um, because of the higher 
um, initial stocks after a mild 2022-23 winter season. And when we are looking at the major Asian markets, we also see that gas demand has been declining by an estimated 4%, partly because of lower electricity demand, but also uh, due to improving nuclear availability, particularly in Japan. When we look at uh, China, we see that um, gas demand is clearly back on a growth trajectory. Our estimates indicate that China's gas consumption increased by about 7% compared to 2022. And this is driven by um, the expansion of commercial and, in, and industrial activity, as well as higher gas burn uh, in the power sector. And we also see um, gas demand returning to growth in India and other emerging Asian markets. But altogether, when we combine the demand in all these major import markets, we see that it has been down by about uh, 20 BCM compared to uh, 2022. And also the storage injection needs were about 20 BCM lower compared to, uh, to the year before. Um, and as such, this was playing a key role in easing up market fundamentals um, in 2023. But we should not forget that um, the market remains fundamentally tight from a a supply perspective. On this slide, we are showing um, the main trade channels behind global um, gas trade, namely European and China's um, pipeline imports, as well as um, global energy supply. And I think what is really key here is to uh, follow the red dot, which shows that um, the overall uh, supply to the global uh, gas market has been uh, declining both in 2022 and 2023, simply because the steep reduction in Russia's pipe gas deliveries to Europe, we are talking about 120 BCM in just two years, was not offset by the rather mere increase in global energy supply, which increased by about 40 BCM in, the, in these two years. But when we are looking at the medium term, the prospects are somewhat brighter. Altogether, we expect that energy supply will expand by about 25% or 130 BCM between 2022 and 2026. And the United States alone will account for a half of incremental energy supply during this period, reinforcing its position as the world's largest energy exporter. Um, about 70% of this incremental energy supply is expected to arrive to the market between 2025 and 2026. Um, and this strong growth in energy supply could of course loosen uh, market fundamentals and also ease up some of the supply security uh, concerns. Despite this softening of market fundamentals, as highlighted by my director, uh, Mr. Keisuke Kestadamori, the structural changes which emerged in 2021 will persist for years. And this slide shows us the key building bricks of this new global gas market, which is gradually taking shape after last year's gas supply shock. LNG became a new base load supply for Europe by China's balancing role in the global gas market is set to increase. And while gas demand reductions are set to accelerate in the mature markets of the Asian Pacific and Europe, there are question marks on how to de-risk investment in gas infrastructure and the role of long-term contracts. And there is also a clear need um, to assess the value of new gas supply flexibility mechanisms, both via physical gas reserves and enhanced international cooperation. The share of LNG in Europe primary gas supply rose uh, from an average 10% during the 2010s to around 33% in 2022. And this really highlights the drastic shift in the role of LNG over the last um, two years. In the past, LNG was 
really the marginal molecule in the European context. Today, it became um, really a baseload uh, source of supply. Um, and its share in Europe total primary gas supply is expected to average at just above 35% between 2022-2026, a share similar to Russia's piped gas before the invasion of Ukraine. But of course, there are changes on how this gas is being procured. Historically, long-term contracts together with domestic production met around 80 to 90% of EU gas demand on an annual basis. The non-observance of Russian piped gas contracts steeply increased the European Union's reliance on spot procurements, rising from just 20% in 2021 to around 50% in 2023. And the share of spot is expected to increase to 70% by 2030 if expiring contracts are not renewed and no new contracts are signed. And this will naturally increase Europe exposure to the greater price volatility of spot markets in the coming years. Hence, a fine balance should be struck between non-Russian long-term contracts and procurements from an increasingly liquid spot market. In contrast, China's role as a balancing market is set to grow. China alone accounted for about 30% of all LNG contracts signed in the past five years. And as such, China's share in the total active LNG contracts is expected to increase from around 12% in 2025 to close to 25% by 2030. And this will naturally boost the role of Chinese companies in LNG trading and in the optimization of global energy flows. Nevertheless, China's potential role as a balancing market comes with several caveats, including the fact that the majority of China's energy importers are state-owned companies, and as such, market-driven decision-making might be overwritten by supply security concerns or geopolitical considerations. Now, the global energy crisis um, triggered by Russia's invasion of Ukraine put also the spotlight on natural gas storage and its regulation. And this slide gives us a summary of the underground storage outlook over the medium term. Um, and it shows that um, storage capacity is expected to expand by around 9% or 30 5 BCM with porous reservoirs accounting for more than 75 of total um, capacity additions. And in addition to that, energy storage capacity is expected to increase by close to 10 BCM over the forecast period. What is also worth to note is that China is expected alone to account for more than half of these capacity additions with around 20 BCM of underground storage capacity um, being constructed in the country and around 5 BCM of energy storage is also being developed in China. In Europe, most of the additional underground storage capacity comes from the expansion of the Tuzgulu storage facility in Turkey, as well as storage products in Bulgaria, Poland, and the re reopening of the rough storage facility in the UK. This map provides us with a high-level overview of the different storage policies and regulatory frameworks which have been initiated over the last two years, including the European Union, Union's new storage regulation, Japan's strategic buffer LNG initiative, and Australia's East Coast gas system framework. But in an increasingly globalized gas market, storage regulations can have extra regional implications. Hence, we believe that a closer dialogue and improved transparency on storage regulations is needed. I would like to close this presentation with this picture with Minister Nishimura at the 2023 Energy Producer Consumer Conference in Tokyo. A new global gas market is taking shape, bringing new challenges, new question marks, which 
necessitates a closer cooperation between responsible producers and consumers on a number of issues, including the reduction of methane emissions, commercial structures enabling more flexible energy supply, and gas storage uh, voluntary reserve mechanisms. The IEA stands ready to facilitate such dialogue by providing data, analysis, special insights, and using the task force on gas and clean fuels, market monitoring and supply security as an effective platform for information sharing. I would like to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Um, thank you for that introduction, uh, Dennis. I didn't hear all of it um, quite, but um, my pleasure to be here today to uh, participate in this discussion. These, uh, as Gurge said, these discussions are important in terms of understanding what's happen happening and thinking about um, how we uh, take best control of the situation uh, moving forward. So, and, and as Dennis said, uh, over the next 15 minutes or so, we'll do a slightly deeper dive uh, into US LNG flexibility and supply security. I think um, Gerge covered uh, a number of the key points um, that I want to bring out. Um, firstly, we are a market, the, the global gas market, we're a market uh, significantly out of balance after the supply shock uh, last year. LNG has been instrumental in getting uh, markets, in particular Europe, through that supply shock um, so far, although obviously we're not out of the woods yet. US LNG playing a key uh, and important role in that, and I think an important role in bringing the markets back into balance, uh, as Gergay alluded to, uh, as we look forward uh, from where we are. So if you can uh, go through the next slide and to the next one, Gergay. So uh, firstly, an acknowledgement of the uh, importance uh, of Asia uh, to uh, LNG. A lot of discussion about Europe at the moment, but as we look out um, in terms of primary energy growth, um, natural gas demand growth and LNG growth, we see the longer term uh, really a, a, about Asia. Asia is the uh, key demand driver, for primary energy demand, 56% of positive growth, uh, natural gas demand growth, 36% of positive growth. Um, and then that plays through into LNG demand growth. And this is the Chenier outlook to 2040. And you can see the big uh, growth demand drivers, South Asia, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Southeast Asia, and China. Asia accounting for about 80% of the uh, future growth outlook over the broadly next two decades. So really Asia, uh, critical to LNG, LNG and the evolving uh, global uh, model flexibility critical to Asia. Gergé, the next slide. And um, US LNG has been uh, critical in underpinning the current supply wave. You can see from this chart, which is uh, capacity um, in place or under construction. You can see, as Gergé said, the US now the largest uh, exporting nation, largest capacity in place, 90 million tonnes. Uh, the US running year to date as the largest uh, exporter through uh, through uh, October. And I think that inevitably uh, means that the US will become the largest uh, exporting uh, country uh, this year on an annual basis for the first time. And you can see we are uh, rather unusually in 2023, in a year where there are no capacity additions, the uh, we reached the end of the first supply wave. And as of 2024, we will start ramping up uh, a new set of capacities uh, across four new projects, one expansion, um, another 80 million tonnes under, under construction, which will take us broadly to 170 uh, million tonnes of capacity. Obviously, that is the capacity under construction, uh, much more uh, planned beyond that. Next slide, Gerge. Um, Here's a few details of uh, what's happening at Chenier. We have a 10 million tonne uh, expansion under construction at our Corpus Christi facility, which will add 
uh, about 10 million uh, 10 million tons of capacity about 44 uh, percent complete as of September. We have another uh, two trains, uh, broadly 5 million tonnes, uh, currently filed for addition to that expansion. And then we turn our attention to uh, an expansion at Sabine Pass, which we have been busy uh, commercialising uh, recently. Next slide, Gergo. And you can see, uh, based on our demand uh, projection, that the US playing a significant role in uh, filling the gap through the next uh, supply wave, the third supply wave. But our belief is that there's still room uh, on the 2030 uh, timescale for, for more capacity to be added. And by 2040, we estimate taking into account declines in uh, legacy uh, projects that will need around about 135 million tonnes of new supply to keep the market in balance. But no doubt, as Gergay said, the large wave that's under construction will help um, mitigate the supply shock that we saw last year with the curtailment of Russian supplies and will help the market uh, rebalance as we go through that significant build in capacity from uh, 25 through to 30. Next slide, Gergay. One, I think, slightly unique aspect of the US is the uh, multi-project uh, landscape that you see there. Um, almost uniquely in LNG, there are uh, many project developers developing many projects, all of whom are in competition with each other. There's no sovereign uh, entity, no government kind of um, determining which project uh, progresses in the way that you find uh, in other places, or indeed suggesting that there should only be one uh, national project. It's a very competitive landscape. Obviously, the government sets the uh, permitting process uh, that the projects need to go through, the, the licensing, but it's a multi-project uh, multi landscape. Project on project competition makes sure that not only do uh, costs have to remain competitive against uh, other projects, but also it's a, an environment that um, drives innovation. Go to the next slide, Gergay. The underpinning um, element, I think, in terms of the growth of the US, the success of the US has, been, has of course been the uh, growth in the significant resource base, um, from uh, kind of 2004 onwards plotted on the left-hand chart showing the impact that uh, shale gas has had on the natural gas resources of the US. This is the Potential Gas Committee who assess the um, uh, US resources on a biannual basis. Technically recoverable resources uh, shown here, they estimate about 4,000 uh, TCF of gas um, technically recoverable uh, in the US. So this is the US, not, not North America. Um, and synchronous with that increase in resource has been a huge increase in gas production, broadly a doubling since 2006 from 50 BCF a day to uh, now running at about 104 BCF a day. Uh, 1,040 BCM per annum equivalent in European terms. Um, and those resources being monetized at uh, lower uh, prices than we saw uh, prior to, to 2006. You can see some uh, ups and downs as the market responds to short term uh, dynamics, but broadly, um, natural gas prices have come down over time. Currently, the forward curve sitting at around about $4 average through uh, the next decade or so. And if you look at the cost curve for the US, um, a lot of gas that can be produced at uh, four to five dollars um, uh, out along that long flat cost curve. So we're very confident that the uh, resource base is there to underpin both the significant uh, domestic market, but also uh, exports over many decades. If we go to the next slide, Gergo. So if we look at US LNG, we'll find that um, as that first wave and indeed the second wave has grown, um, 
we've seen a lot of people buy uh, LNG, US LNG into their portfolios. On the left-hand side, um, these are the Chenier long-term counterparties. We now have uh, 33 uh, long-term counterparties. Uh, in terms of geography, spread across the globe. In terms of functionality, we have gas utilities, power utilities, but also portfolio players, traders. And if you look at the right-hand side, you can see when we take a snapshot of uh, 2030 contracts, you can see uh, a quick look at who has uh, purchased US uh, LNG. So that's US in total, not just Chenier. And again, you can see a broad range of geographies, Europe and Asia, uh, and functionalities, traders, portfolio players. If you look at the last, the contracting for the last couple of years, you'll get a slightly different um, pie chart with a greater emphasis on Asian off takers and portfolio players. So um, we've we've really seen Asia and uh, international players um, contracting a lot of US LNG in the last two years. Um, in response to the supply shock. Go to the next uh, slide, Gerge. So we'll, I think one of the things that US LNG has undoubtedly done is it has created uh, not only supply availability, but a more flexible, more liquid, more global uh, gas market. Here we see a um, overview of the development of the industry right back from its inception the slow speed at which it over time added uh, spot and short term um, volumes to its um, to its trade. Initially, a bilateral um, a, a trade based on bilateral point to point deals. Uh, we started to see some initial uh, slow evolution of that through between 1985 and 2000, and then we really started to see a growing. Uh, flexibility um, in in the trade through the 2000s and actually that that was kind of happening through the first uh, supply wave 2009-10 you can see there's a step up but really the US since 2016 has driven a lot more flexibility liquidity into the um, into the marketplace and these are the Gignal uh, numbers uh, for 2022, they estimate about 35% of global trade was done on a spot and short term, i.e. contracts of dur durations of less than four years, four years or less, um, as of last year. If we go to the next slide, Gergay. Now, there are no real uh, primary indicators of liquidity. So here are some secondary indicators of just how uh, liquidity has has developed on the back of that flexibility. Top left, you can see the Gignal data again, but I've, I've picked out the true spot volumes uh, in red. So um, cargoes delivered um, uh, within 90 days. Um, so the, the real spot cargoes in the industry and you can see how those have grown to become the major share of that spot and short term category. On the top right, you can see trading house activity uh, volumes accounted for by the four largest trading houses um, in LNG grew significantly over that synchronously with that growth in US LNG. So 2016 through to 2020. Um, Cargo by cargoes awarded by tender. So these are markets tendering for volumes. You can see almost no cargoes tendered uh, prior to 2014, uh, growing to a significant share uh, through 2022. And then JKM derivatives um, shown, trade in derivatives uh, shown in the bottom right. And you can see again that um, growing synchronously with that growth in flexible US volumes. Although I think as everyone's aware, the supply shock the, and more importantly, the volatility that took place in 2022, um, kind of a, a setback for the market. Uh, a lot of um, traders uh, reduced their trading positions uh, within that market uh, volatility. Um, and you can see we're now starting to grow again, although nowhere uh, close to where we were. So all of the indicators show growing liquidity. I would caution if we look at the churn rate of JKM, which is the 
ratio of the derivative to the underlying physical. You can see um, we, we've got around about a churn of 1.6 at the moment. At 2021 peak, it was 2.2. Um, that is far below what you would consider as a fully liquid marketplace, which would typically be a churn of 10 to 11 plus uh, to be considered liquid and, and even then not uh, hugely liquid. Um, so you can see we're very far from being commoditized, but we do have a lot of growing flexibility, growing liquidity in the marketplace, which has helped the, um, the market get through the current supply shock. If we go to the next slide, Gergay. And really, as Gergay was saying, USLNG, flexible USLNG has been critical in helping Europe get through its um, supply shock last year. Um, in 2022, we saw an incremental 45 million tonnes of LNG flow into Europe. Uh, the United States accounted for about 64% of the incremental flows into the marketplace. So although we are far from being a commoditized and fully flexible global trade, um, the flexibility that we do have has inherently helped the, um, the global system uh, get through the uh, Russian supply, uh, supply shock that we saw last year, as indeed it did um, back on the Fukushima disaster and going way back to 2007, the Choetsu earthquake. The scale of flexibility, the, the inflow of volumes uh, larger for each of those supply shocks, indicating the ability of the system to accommodate um, the, the shock uh, improving as we've gone through time. Next uh, slide, Gergay. I've talked a, a, a bit about security of supply or I focused on security of supply. I think it's also important to acknowledge the other two legs of the trilemma, affordability, which will come back as the markets come back into balance, and also um, sustainability. So an indicator really here that uh, certainly Chenier, but I, I, would, I would assert the rest of the industry haven't forgotten about the sustainability leg and continuing to work um, in, in terms of improving the sustainability of LNG supply in the um, in the case of Chenier through our QMRV program, where we're working with various partners in the upstream uh, shipping midstream uh, sectors. We go to the next slide. So I'm going to end with two slides, which really just give a, a, a bit of a broad overview um, uh, of the industry. The US, you can see the top five suppliers in 2040 plotted in the chart on the uh, left. The US set to become the largest uh, exporter this year, overtaking Australia uh, and Qatar, and playing a critical role in terms of providing uh, future supplies into the global marketplace, uh, along with uh, Qatar, helping to keep the market in balance. On the right-hand side, we can see how critical that is for Asia, although there's been a lot of focus on Europe, and I've plotted the EU27 um, plus one, as uh, a kind of a, a regional market to show the extent of the supply shock that we've seen and the, the huge pull on volumes. But you can see the top five in 2040 in terms of nations are all Asian uh, countries. Different uh, trajectories in terms of growth, in terms of plateau, in terms of declining, depending on how mature uh, those markets are, depending on the role of gas in those markets. Um, and I've got a couple of quotes at the bottom, Gergé, which actually come from the IEA 2017, which I don't think have been uh, bettered. Um, the US helping to create a shift towards a more flexible liquid and global gas market. Transformation of LNG markets um, in terms of flexibility, liquidity creates a huge opportunity for gas users in Asia. And I still think, although those were 2017 quotes, I still think those are as true today as they were uh, back in 2017 when the IEA first um, put them forward. Final slide. I'm not going to go through all of the bullet points, but just to kind of bring out some of the highlights, US growth has been rapid and influential. Um, flexible US volumes now consistently reaching over 30 markets 
um, around the world. Almost all buyers have some uh, US LNG in their portfolios. Additional US capacity growth will be material. We already have 80 million tonnes under construction, and that is not the end. Chenier, amongst others, have plans to continue to grow. And flexible US LNG is enhancing global market resilience, making the global marketplace uh, more responsive, more flexible, uh, more liquid. Um, and I think it's going to continue to do that as US uh, continues to grow. However bad we find the situation we uh, find ourselves in, it would have been a lot better without the scale and the flexibility of um, US exports over the past couple of years. So that um, ends my, sorry, slightly over 50, uh, 15 minutes, but um, back to you, Dennis. Many thanks, Andrew, for this excellent presentation. And um, Dennis, um, can you hear us? Um, um, it might be colleagues, it might be that, that um, Dennis is experiencing some um, connection issues. So I would like really um, to thank you again, um, Andrew, for, for this excellent overview. On, on on the growing role of, uh, of of the US in the global energy market and I would like now to um, give the floor to um, to Tatiana Mitrova um, to, to give us um, an overview of the recent uh, developments around um, Russian uh, natural gas um, Tatiana Thank you. the, the yeah. floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gergely, and thanks to colleagues from the IEA for this uh, invitation. It's great pleasure and honor for me. You know, what I'm going to present to you is That's not... Russian, uh, natural gas. Um, Tatiana, the, the floor is yours. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Gergely, and uh, thank you to the colleagues from IEA for this invitation. It's great pleasure and honor for me. Uh, what I'm going to present to you is a bit different. Uh, it's a different perspective. It's not like a baseline scenario which we were discussing previously. And uh, it's uh, just my understanding of what the new Russian gas export strategy is. So it's a guess. It's uh, actually prepared from the open sources. I might be mistaken. Yeah, so I'm specifically making a disclaimer. But I think that talking about the global gas security, it's extremely important these days to take into account these potential developments which can challenge the baseline scenario. Therefore, I will take these 15 minutes to navigate you through this new vision, which is quite different from all the uh, graphs and charts that uh, Gergé and Andrew were showing in their presentations regarding Russia. Yeah. So, uh, as you know, and Gergé has explained it greatly, the results of uh, 2022 invasion, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine were extremely painful for Russia itself. So, Russian pipeline gas exports to Europe have collapsed, uh, while actually Russian LNG exports were doing quite well. Actually, they've increased. Yeah, um, In 2023, uh, we are at a rather low uh, pipeline gas exports still, uh, while there are already several interesting trends visible. Uh, trend number one. Actually, for the first time, uh, the uh, West-oriented uh, uh, LNG gas exports are taking over West-oriented Russian gas pipeline exports. More than 50%, you can see it on the uh, uh, left-hand side uh, chart. Uh, second trend is that pipeline gas supplies to the East equaled pipeline gas supplies to the West. 
So now uh, in 2023, uh, power of Siberia will deliver approximately 22 BCM to China, while pipeline gas to exports, uh, pipeline gas exports to Europe are expected at 25 BCM. So nearly uh, equal volumes. And LNG supplies to the east equaled LNG supplies to the west. So these um, pivot to the east, which Russia has announced for many years, it uh, suddenly happened, uh, not in a way it was intended, uh, but it is there. And basically what uh, I'm trying to argue is that it, it might have very uh, significant implications uh, for the global markets. Uh, the question which I'm asked quite frequently is, okay, huge volumes of these ATBCM, which Gergé has mentioned, um, they uh, got uh, locked uh, inside uh, Russia in Western Siberia. So what is Russia going to do with all these gas? Yeah, uh, there was a reduction in production, obviously last year, 12% and most likely 10% this year, mainly uh, taken by Gazprom, while the other gas producers were actually increasing their output. Uh, there is some growth of the domestic demand, but obviously it's not able to absorb all this excess gas. Uh, there are all these discussions about developing gas chemistry, uh, which frankly seem to be quite questionable for me. Uh, there is uh, some growth which is happening already in gas exports uh, to the CIS countries. Uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, there were some exports to Azerbaijan, which are now uh, paused. Uh, actually, they are talking now about approximately 10 billion cubic meters uh, going uh, to uh, Central Asian markets potentially some volumes transiting through Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan to China. Uh, so initially these countries in Central Asia were extremely skeptical about these developments, but now they seem to be quite enthusiastic. One year later, uh, they are all getting engaged uh, in this uh, Central Asian trade. But again, the volumes are not that big. The key two pillars of the new Russian gas export strategy, which is just evolving, it is not yet fixed officially, but at least I can see already some clear outlines. So the first pillar is pipeline exports to Asia, which are widely discussed. Uh, I mean, everybody is talking about power of Siberia 2 pipeline, which is, I mean, the limbo, uh, the, the deal itself is still in limbo. But if the deal is achieved, it is about 50 billion cubic meters. Yeah, and uh, Power of Siberia 1, meanwhile, is building up its capacity. Uh, so in a few years, it will reach its uh, projected 38 BCM nominal capacity. And Eastern Gas Pipeline deal, which was signed right before the war for 10 billion cubic meters, it is proceeding, so most likely it will be completed in time. So these are already quite considerable volumes, all going uh, through pipelines to China, which is, by the way, corresponding to what Gergay was saying about Chinese strategy to uh, build up trading, LNG trading, first of all. But if you have, if you are China and you have all these backup of pipeline gas supplies from Russia, uh, trading positions are becoming much stronger. It will not be extremely um, uh, high margins, high profits for Russia, but uh, preliminary calculations are showing that bringing gas from Western Siberia to China, uh, it still makes some economic sense for Russia, so it's not loss making. And as long as it is supporting national economy, providing um, not, not dollars, but uh, RMBs uh, to, uh, to the Russian budget, it's okay. So it's mutually beneficial both for Russia and for China. So far, China is very cautious with making any announcements. 
uh, uh, and it is not in a hurry, obviously, but frankly, I uh, expect that in the next few years, most likely we will see progress with this particular uh, deal on power of Siberia too, which is already then changing the global gas balance. But the next pillar, in my understanding, is significantly underestimated. Uh, it is LNG exports. Uh, actually, what is happening now in Russia is the discussion on LNG export liberalization and uh, quite significant state support uh, for, uh, for these uh, projects. The official target of 100 million tons LNG exports by 2030, which is just in six years, is reinstated again and again by all the officials. And on the next few slides, I will show to you that theoretically it's achievable. Yeah, I wouldn't uh, put a bet that it will be definitely achieved, but there is uh, some probability, there are some chances that Russia can manage to do it. And in this case, yeah, so I would say LNG exports, they uh, will be uh, probably the most important um, um, potential game changer um, for the Russian gas export strategy. So um, in this case, if you look at this map, uh, you can see that uh, all these um, very well-developed pipeline network to Europe, it is becoming nearly obsolete, while the new pipelines to Asia, the red ones, and including transit through Central Asia, together with the new LNG plants and existing LNG plants in Yamal and Sakhalin, they are indeed diverting all Russian flows to the Asian market, which, as Andrew has stressed several times, is the fastest growing market. So most of the new gas consumption is going to, to be there, and Russia is turning there. And uh, given the financial constraints and financial pressure and inability of Russia to trade in uh, dollars or euros, actually building up relations with uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Vietnam, you name it, all these uh, new consumers, new uh, markets in uh, Asia Pacific, uh, it makes a lot of sense, and Russia potentially is able to provide rather stable supplies, rather low prices, and moreover, I can see already a discussion of providing LNG to power, building the whole supply chain, not just delivering LNG, but also building uh, power plants, which is very much reminding me of the Soviet strategy, in the uh, developing countries, yeah, because Russia now not only needs uh, money, but it also needs badly allies. It needs to build up presence all over the world and uh, to make this anti-Western coalition, if you wish. So here is uh, the last slide where I want to spend a bit more time. And once again, it's quite speculative I made it myself, so there is no reference to an external source. It's just a rough estimate. What could be done if Russia is really serious about all these new developments? And it seems to be very serious about all these new developments. And you can see that basically our uh, after significant uh, decline uh, in uh, 2022, 2023, already in the next couple of years, with the expansion of power of Siberia 1, first of all, uh, with the construction uh, of Arctic LNG 2, Russia is uh, in a good position to increase its uh, gas exports again. And if we are talking about uh, the time horizon of uh, 2030, uh, if you put together the exports to CIS countries, which are most likely to stay there and to expand, I frankly do not see why shouldn't they. Uh, if we assume that Turk Stream is still there, 
even if Ukrainian transit is not, deal is not prolonged and the only gas which flows through pipelines to Europe is Turk Stream, yeah, but it's still 16 BCM. Um, and if uh, the uh, there is no other gas going to Europe by pipelines, but uh, there are new LNG projects, Arctic LNG 2, we for which all the supplies are uh, all the equipment is secured and i mean Novatec is in a very good position to finish the project there might be some delays there might be problems with spare parts and with software but i'm sure that they can do it yeah uh baltic lng pipeline the Though the project uh, was always quite questionable but they are proceeding they are building it up a uh, newly announced project, Murmansk LNG, which is supposed actually to grab uh, gas from uh, Gazprom's pipelines in the uh, western part of Russia and liquefy it in Murmansk. It really has very good chances uh, for uh, construction. Um, and then on top of that, all these uh, pipelines uh, in uh, Siberia uh, going to China, power of Siberia 1, Far Eastern route, and even the beginning of the construction of power of Siberia 2. Here I put just 15 BCM by 2030 out of 50, which uh, is the full capacity because it takes time to reach this full capacity. So it's quite, I would say, uh, modest estimate of what could be done. I'm not taking into account Opel LNG or Yakutsk LNG or several other projects which are also under discussion. But these are like the most realistic ones. And altogether, it gives us 235 BCM, which is already comparable to the pre-war uh, volumes. So it is uh, quite a significant uh, part of the uh, international gas trade. And if Russia succeeds with this strategy, which is definitely subject to uh, sanctions, yeah, and we see already that the sanctions on transshipment in Murmansk and Kamchatka and sanctions on Arctic LNG2 are there. But if you follow all the developments with the sanctions on the Russian oil, you can see that actually Russian companies are quite successful in finding some bypassing routes. Here, I assume, given the whole importance of this LNG development for the Russian state, uh, there will be a lot of support and a lot of efforts. And by the way, quite a lot of interest from the potential consumers in non-OECD Asia. So, um, I think I'll stop on that, but the very last message which I want to give to you, just imagine this world, 2030, 2035, when most of the Russian gas is not going to Europe, but it's going to China, and China is becoming the biggest, not only LNG, generally gas trader in the world, and Russia is also building up long-term relations with a significant number of Asian developing countries, providing to them LNG to power. So that might be quite a different picture. And I'm not insisting that that's the way it's going to be, but just as one of hypotheses, I think we should think about it. And the last but not least uh, part of this puzzle, in this case, it will be extremely fragmented market. Part of it being traded most likely under sanctions. Part of it uh, in dollars, part of it in yuan. With different transaction um, uh, infrastructure, with the, some of the participants of the markets not being able to deal with each other, with some alliances inside it. So this fragmented market, it's also, I would say, quite a threat for the global uh, gas security. And yeah, just think about it. Meanwhile, I'll uh, stop uh, on that. Thank you. Tatiana, many thanks for this fascinating um, presentation. Um, when I was um, listening um, to you, um, I was thinking about this this very old saying, according to which um, Russia is never as strong as it seems, 
um, from the distance, but it is also never so weak as it seems uh, from the distance. And, and I think it is, to some extent, it is also true uh, when we are considering um, Russia's energy and um, and gas sector. Um, the second thought I had is that um, before uh, the 2022 invasion of Ukraine, Russia's strategy was really about diversification, about diversifying its exports between um, Europe, Asia, and the global energy market. It seems now um, that Russia strategy is now not about diversification, but really to um, trying to to forge some sort of long-term relationships with these um, dynamically uh, growing uh, markets um, in Asia. But of course, maybe the the, the negotiation power of, of Russia has, has weakened um, compared to, uh, to, to the to the, before the 2022 uh, period. But it is indeed indeed a fascinating um, discussion. And with that, I would like to um, give the floor uh, to Mr. Maciej Cisewski, who will um, present on an other very uh, resilient uh, market, um, the European um, Union. Um, and Maciej, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, uh, IEA colleagues, for organizing this, this very important workshop. Um, as you have, uh, the previous speakers have already outlined uh, we've been witnessing a big shock to the market and Europe was in the very center of this shock so let me give you also a European uh, perspective uh, on the events uh, since 2021 uh, where we stand now and where we are we believe we are going uh, thank you Gary for the presentation if we can move to the to the first slide I will not spend much time on the market situation main drivers in 2022 mostly because I think previous panelists uh, presented it in a perfect way. Um, I just want to uh, highlight that uh, Europe was already very much dependent on gas imports um, uh, with domestic production declining uh, in the last uh, 10, 10 years. Um, so the readjustment that some of the speakers mentioned had to be very quick and was rather dramatic, um, uh, although maybe this is not the right word uh, when comparing to the, to the invasion, but the disappearing pipeline gas from Russia after the invasion of Ukraine, which until then was the backbone of uh, EU's uh, supply, um, was something that was impossible to immediately replace with only one a single source of alternative supplies. Despite years of efforts to diversify um, uh, supplies to Europe, we have managed to ensure that each part of Europe had different options but uh, the, uh, the scale of the disruption was just too big uh, to not create a big shock for the market. So with these two graphs, you only see the, the disappearing pipeline uh, gas from Russia and the pickup of LNG supplies. The, the graph on the right, uh, it always looks back 12 months, uh, showing that since the end of 2022, uh, we are at a very different level uh, of LNG supplies around 120 BCM for the last 12 months. The trend is likely to continue. Moving to the next one, um, as the European Commission, European Union, but not only us, also in close collaboration with EU member states, this was an example of an extremely quick and efficient cooperation between uh, the EU and, and uh, EU member states, but also, and I have to signal here this very strongly, also with international partners, we have, we have had a very good cooperation with the United States, we have good cooperation with Japan and other partners, uh, IEA as well, uh, we have uh, left no domain of uh, energy policy untouched in terms of regulation. Uh, we were looking, uh, as you can see here, uh, through uh, demand side, supply side, security of supply measures, transparency, both at EU level, but also at the level of, of the member states. Uh, we can move on. I will not bore you with all the details of all the measures we applied, but to give you now a bit of a flavor uh, Gergely at the very beginning uh, already discussed the issue of storage in Europe, a big asset we have, a big uh, source of flexibility, uh, around 100 BCM uh, uh, of underground uh, storage, providing a lot of flexibility um, uh, and stability uh, for the winter season. Uh, in 2021, we entered the winter, uh, before the invasion still, with a relatively low storage level, which in addition was aggravating the situation. 
And for the first time uh, in, in, in history, as the European Union, we have decided together with member states to give more prominence uh, and to the strategic value of the underground storage in Europe. We have set targets and trajectories for member states uh, and for the EU level as a whole to make sure that for the winter, uh, for the next winter, we would have at least 80% in storage and for the subsequent winters, 90% of storage. As you can see, uh, the ahead of 2022-23 winter, we have achieved in mid, uh, by mid-November 95% uh, of gas in storage, which exceeded the target actually. Uh, and this year, at this very moment, mid-November, we are almost at 100% of storage. Uh, in addition, uh, which for uh, people not following gas issues closely, uh, also Ukrainian storage is hosting quite some gas of European uh, companies and international companies. Uh, now, moving on uh, to the next aspect of our intervention uh, and uh, trying to support the markets in tackling the, the, the shock of 2022 um, was the gas demand reduction. Um, as a continent which is so much dependent on, on supplies from outside of the Union, we had to look at demand reduction measures, energy efficiency. Um, we have set a target of 15% uh, across the Union. Um, and uh, with the latest data I can share with you, uh, we have we keep actually exceeding the 15% demand reduction level, uh, which between August 2022 and September 2023 is equivalent to quite a big amount, which is 77 uh, BCM uh, of uh, gas equivalent. Uh, as you can see, uh, among member states of the European Union, uh, there is very different uh, energy savings or gas savings, uh, which contributes to this percentage. Um, here with colleagues from IEA, we are looking very closely into what this exactly means. Was it behavioral changes? Was it uh, impact of the weather or of industry? Um, maybe too early, it's not, not also focus of today's workshop, but it's not all uh, positive because of course, part of this uh, demand reduction uh, is more structural, uh, could constitute demand destruction uh, because of high prices. Uh, but more assessment is needed and uh, whatever is efficiency, I think is pretty welcome. Uh, and we are uh, also seeing this as a positive signal in terms of flexibility of our uh, gas demand side. Uh, moving on to the supply side, um, here uh, with colleagues uh, in DG Energy, uh, we have compared the data uh, for uh, supply of gas, both pipeline and energy between 2021, 2022 and uh, 2023. Here I see there's a little mistake. It's up to September 2023. Uh, you can see very much uh, changing role of Russian gas in EU's LNG mix and increasing role of LNG, uh, which as uh, also Gergely um, uh, described at the beginning from a from an important role of around 20%, but uh, definitely not a major role, uh, now increased in 2022 to being around 40%. This year, uh, we also expect around 118, 120 BCM of LNG in EU's uh, gas mix, uh, which uh, as uh, IEA uh, presented, would be maybe around 36, uh, 37, maybe towards 40% of the mix. So the backbone of the LNG uh, of the EU gas market. Um, what is interesting and where more assessment is needed, also with colleagues from IEA, is uh, Europe is now between 2021 and 2023 contesting much more of the uh, free on board and flexible volumes of LNG. Um, at the same time, we are also observing that uh, long term contracts for LNG are being signed. So what is important uh, to notice is that in this discussion about long term contracts, it's not that Europe is not participating. Uh, signing long-term contracts is not against uh, long-term decarbonization objectives where uh, Europe is leading the efforts. This is actually happening. So Europe will not be only relying on, on spot cargos, as I think uh, Shenya uh, and Andrew also uh, signaled on its graph. Moving on, uh, one more graph on LNG, uh, complementing a little bit what was said before. We expect this year still increase of LNG imports uh, to the European Union, um, a more less dramatic increase by 6%, uh, because beginning of this of last year, 
uh, LNG imports did not pick up yet. So this is why, uh, despite monthly LNG imports being slightly lower than at the same time last year, uh, we will most likely reach a record uh, imports of LNG to European Union. Now, uh, let me uh, insist that as European Union and EU member states, we have been trying to use all the toolbox we have had uh, on the demand side and on the supply side. And if, if Gergi, you could please pass to the next slide. We have also tried to test some new and innovative tools on the supply side, the demand aggregation and joint purchasing mechanism called Aggregate EU. Uh, we have introduced it earlier this year. We have so far conducted uh, three rounds of tenders when buyers from the European Union, but also energy community are actually bringing the demand together through the mechanism. And then this is out tendered out to uh, suppliers uh, from Europe, from outside of Europe. Uh, everyone uh, can participate except for uh, the Russian uh, suppliers. This is a tool supporting diversification, optionality and security of supply with products uh, ranging from really short term products until March 2025. On the next slide, I will just give you a preview how it is going. It is a very innovative tool. Uh, it created a lot of discussion, um, also criticism, but also a lot of interest and positive comments. So far, after three rounds, we consider that the tool was rather welcomed by the market. Uh, we have managed to attract um, 44 BCM of demand from European and energy community buyers. Um, which was met or responded to by 52 BCM uh, on the supply side. We have matched volumes uh, around 34 uh, BCM, which is around 10% uh, of total EU consumption in 2022. We are slowly uh, approaching 200 participants on the EU energy platform. So uh, as an experience, um, we try to make it as useful and as good as possible. Um, and it is rather a good story. Uh, in uh, making sure that we uh, support markets and uh, the transparency of the markets. Next slide, please. I will not spend much time on this, but very important message. We have seen that the fact uh, European Union and the EU market after uh, several waves of liberalization is a very transparent market. Every market player, uh, every other country in, in the world can check exactly how much gas is in storage, are we on trajectory, uh, how is availability of LNG terminals in the European Union policymaking? Europe is a transparent open book uh, for gas markets. We think this is an important element uh, which contributed to Europe actually adjusting uh, to this shock of supply of 2022. And on the next slide, uh, to even further support uh, this transparency uh, to also European uh, players, uh, we have uh, introduced uh, together with Acer uh, LNG benchmark, uh, which uh, was publishing daily LNG price assessments. Um, never uh, too little transparency. Uh, this would be my message here. Uh, moving on to uh, general conclusions, and I will finish on that uh, to make sure we have also time for questions and answers. Um, my last slide, Gregory, please. Um, as it was also uh, uh, presented by other speakers, we believe that EU's uh, role on LNG markets, the exposure on LNG markets in the next uh, three, four years until 2026 at least, will remain at quite stable levels. So Europe will be one of the biggest participants on uh, global LNG markets. Uh, with the experience of 2022, we believe, and this is really a place where I think we could be discussing this as well, we believe there is a lot of space for collaboration, for more transparency between different regions. Uh, we already are working with IEA uh, partners on making sure that both um, energy data, gas markets, stocks, flexibility reserves across the globe uh, are uh, better coordinated. There's more transparency about them. Uh, and of course, this discussion cannot take place without uh, methane reduction measures. And we are actively cooperating with like-minded partners with uh, with for example, IEA, Japan, uh, Korea, of course, the US uh, as well, on making sure that the markets of tomorrow are more transparent, there's more collaboration between us, and methane reduction measures are very high on the agenda. Finally, as the workshop is about security of supply, we believe that the security of supply of tomorrow 
will be uh, will evolve will has to capture the complexity of the energy markets not only of gas markets but also increased electrification increased globalization the the threats including to critical infrastructure are becoming more complex to assess because they are more intertwined so the future security of supply has to be much more holistic and take all this into into account so a lot of work uh, ahead of us regulators but i think IEA uh, and like-minded partners are really well placed to help us build secure system and gas markets of the future on the way to transition. Thank you very much. Maciej, many thanks for um, for the very insightful uh, presentation and also for the excellent cooperation. Um, between the IEA and the European Commission. This is very much appreciated and um, valued. Um, I think now we can open up um, the floor for uh, for for the Q&A. Um, and I we would like to maybe um, start with, with, with one round of, of questions about um, the midstream infrastructure, because we, we had been talking a lot about um, you know, the supply side, um, the, the large energy um, projects, pipeline uh, projects. But um, I'm wondering that because behind every every Um, um, around the developments of those pipelines, which could have uh, negatively impact um, the scale up of US LNG in the medium term. And I have a similar question um, to, to Tatiana. Tatiana, you mentioned the Murmansk um, LNG project uh, in, in Russia, which um, I believe is being developed uh, by, by Novatec. Um, but in a way, it has to be also fed uh, from the gas transmission uh, system of Gazprom. So I'm wondering that um, where the two uh, companies stand on that. Um, is there is there a compromise being found on this issue? Um, and Maciej, uh, I have also one midstream infrastructure related question to you. Um, the European Union um, and its member countries have been uh, building up uh, very quickly uh, additional regasification capacity in the last um, um, two years. Um, we hear some voices that that uh, maybe th th this uh, could create some lock-in effects. Um, and um, I'm wondering if there is sort of speak any guidance um, guidelines on how to avoid that that we, we create um, any lock-in effects um, by investing in gas-related infrastructure, which is at the moment needed to uh, to tackle the immediate uh, gas supply security issues. Um, thank you. So maybe, Andrew, could we start with, with you? Okay. Thank, thank you, Gurge. I, I lost you for a moment there, I'm afraid. I'm not sure whether it was my link or yours, but um, I can guess what you asked me. Uh, infrastructure, pipelines. So yes, we. I, I talked about the resource base. There's a... Res, there's a um, a resource base that can underpin both domestic demand and exports for many uh, decades. But there is no doubt that permitting pipelines, large infrastructure has got harder in the US um, of late. And I think we're, we're seeing um, most uh, consultants, commentators make the assumption that actually when we look at the big resources in the US, so obviously Marcellus Utica up in the Northeast, uh, Permian um, and uh, kind of the Midcon uh, down in, in the Gulf Coast region, with the growth in, with the, with the difficulty of putting in place in particular long distance um, interstate pipelines uh, that we've seen recently, that actually the solution is going to be uh, more biased towards uh, the southern resources um, in terms of supplying the LNG demand e export demand growth, which is going to be the key demand driver as we look out over over the coming decades. 
So most commentators will have a view in which the Marcellus Utica is not growing significantly, even though that's uh, the kind of the, the, the largest resource. And then, uh, and the, actually, the LNG facilities will rely on the southern resources, which in most cases means interstate solutions, which are easier to permit, or shorter pipelines. I think there is still a need for the LNG developers to make sure they have their particular solutions um, sorted out in advance. Chenier obviously has eight years of experience of buying and transporting gas in the US system, so we believe we're well placed. Others will be going kind of up the learning curve that that, that we have um, come up over time. Overall, I think it is the US has proven itself to be very uh, flexible, very innovative, 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 very economically res responsive um, as, as a gas system in terms of a gas network, in terms of uh, linking up resources uh, and, and demand. And I think it will continue to do that. So I believe there, there won't be a problem. The last... Um, element I would put in. I don't think the US, if it's going to achieve some of its um, uh, energy transition targets, will be a flatline gas demand system in terms of domestic demand. So as we see domestic demand reduce over time, whatever trajectory that is, many uh, there are many different views, we'll also naturally see some of the system um, become more available for the uh, export component as, as exports grow, as domestic demand reduces. So I think I, I acknowledge the challenges. I think the US is well set to overcome those challenges and I don't see it being a constraining factor on exports. Many thanks, Andrew. And um, that's quite reassuring. Um, Tatiana, so if, maybe if you could, elaborate a bit on, on the, the, the Murmansk energy and, and on the, the pipeline issues. And also there is one uh, question from the Q&A regarding the, the sort of financing of Russia's um, energy projects, um, how this could be financed in the future, taking into consideration the, the sanctions regime. Sure. So first of all, I think I will start with the second question on financing because it actually corresponds to the first one as well. Uh, Russian oil and gas companies last year have earned record profits. And so, uh, and even this year, uh, their revenues are still very high. So they have their own funds, which will slowly uh, be reduced, but so far they're really uh, in a very good financial position to uh, finance new investments. Plus, uh, there is basically unlimited state support from the state banks like VTB, VEP, uh, Sber. Uh, so uh, the whole state is ready to provide money. And actually, Russia domestically is now spending uh, enormous amounts of money for uh, different infrastructure projects. In, and for the military purposes, uh, obviously. So I don't see any problem uh, for at least uh, a decade or so uh, with uh, attracting finances, even without any foreign involvement. Yeah. Um, uh, um, regarding uh, the uh, pipeline and uh, this very um, uh, difficult relationship between Gazprom uh, and Novatec, uh, you know, very interesting thing that I'm observing right now is actually this trend towards liberalization in Russian ga domestic gas market. As Gazprom lost uh, the main argument it was using for many decades uh, that uh, we are responsible for uh, European gas contracts, therefore we cannot be touched. Okay, no more European long-term gas contracts. And the appetite uh, for, uh, you know, uh, unbundling, uh, for uh, LNG export liberalization, which I've mentioned for different reforms domestically, now uh, it, it became much higher. In this particular case with the Murmansk plant, the idea is that um, Novatec will build itself, it will finance from its own funds, pipeline from St. Petersburg to Murmansk, and then transfer this pipeline to Gazprom and pay just a tariff, regulated tariff for it. And another very interesting part of the story is that they are actually planning to use 
uh, call a, a nuclear plant. Instead of uh, gas turbines for liquefaction, they plan to use nuclear energy for liquefaction, which is also quite an innovative solution uh, explained by the lack of uh, Russia's own gas turbines. At the same time, uh, they are building up very actively relationships with Iran, which is good in producing gas turbines. So you see there are very interesting and unexpected alliances evolving here. But as uh, with the Murmansk uh, LNG, there was direct order of the president to find the solution between Gazprom and Novatek, they have no other choice than to deliver to Putin what he is asking for. Thank you very much, um, Tatiana. And um, moving to, to Mache, and uh, there is one uh, question partly inter interlinked with, with, with the questions um, being asked. Uh, in your opinion, is Europe currently um, building over capacities in terms of energy infrastructure? And a second question relates um, to, the, to the volumes which have been actually contracted under um, the the EU joint procurement uh, mechanism, if we could um, elaborate on on those um, volumes. Sure, a very re relevant point. Thank you. So first, on the overcapacity, uh, we have to put the the recent addition of infrastructure into perspective. Since two thousand nine, uh, the EU was supporting a lot uh, to make uh, diversification and building interconnectors, infrastructure, notably in Central Eastern Europe, in Southeastern Europe, to make sure that we are not faced with a situation like in 2009, 2010, where uh, parts of Europe basically were relying on, on a single source of supply. So a uh, bulk of investment into necessary infrastructure was already made. Uh, the same was the case for LNG, but uh, the crisis of 2022 kind of exceeded uh, the, the, the imagination of what would be needed. So um, in, in such a big crisis, uh, it was normal that both the EU and member states had to exceptionally invest in, in infrastructure to make sure that the big gap is, uh, is covered. This is uh, LNG terminals, but there is a lot of floating terminals which have a, a, a certain uh, date of um, um, expired data, data, I would say, or potentially are basically rented and they could be uh, moved away. So um, we believe that uh, through 2030, 2035, they will be used and uh, uh, most likely some of them will not become stranded assets, but will be able to be um, to basically be moved to a place where they are more needed. So as such, um, we don't see that there is a big risk of stranded assets, also because the usual channels of be building energy infrastructure in Europe uh, with the support of the European Union the PCI process, for example, projects of common interest, already since a few years are focusing on electrification, on, on new energy vectors, and on the uh, past projects which were already decided uh, for gas are being completed. So uh, this wave of additional projects, um, this eight FSRUs, for example, we believe they give the necessary flexibility for the next years. Uh, and some of them, potentially, especially the, the LNG terminals, which are fixed, uh, could even be hydrogen ready, for example, or to be ready for the for the future vectors. So that's on infrastructure, but a relevant point, of course, um, on aggregate EU. So the numbers which I presented to you, these are, of course, the numbers, the total demand, the total supply and total matched volumes. As the European Commission, we did not go as far as to actually participate in negotiations or to contract uh, gas. We believe the market is best placed to do that. We just try to support uh, the, the negotiations, uh, which means we have limited uh, knowledge about uh, how many contracts were contracted and which volumes exactly. We are asking and requesting uh, the undertakings to inform us about this. We have some idea about it. Uh, we know that there is a, a, around 6 BCM of gas being negotiated or declared as in negotiations. Uh, we have around 1 BCM, a bit less than 1 BCM uh, of contracts declared as uh, contracted already. However, there's no legal obligation for the entities, so these numbers are not complete. We have information on half of the uh, matched positions and there's no legal obligation. So uh, I have to say that these numbers, I mean, I can give you an idea. Uh, it gives us some idea, but this is definitely not uh, full, 
uh, full knowledge. Uh, we have to be very careful as regulators not to come too close to the negotiations because we do not want market players to actually feel uh, not uh, sa safe uh, or not, uh, uh, I mean, in their commercial negotiations, uh, they should be left alone, basically, and without interference of the regulators. So this is what I, I can say on that. Thank you very much, uh, Maciej. Um, we are nearing um, the close of the first uh, part of, of, of the workshop, but there is one very interesting question I, I would like to address to uh, to Tatiana and to Andrew. Um, so if Russian exports to China and Asia increase as, um, as planned uh, by Russia, what would be the implications uh, for US energy exports? Um, you know what could be the implications for for prices uh, for demand, but but also yeah, in terms of of, of supply uh, coming from from the US. Will I go first, Gogo? Okay. Um, if you wish, in, so yes. Okay. In in simple terms, you know, we come back to supply and demand one hundred and one. If there's more supply, um, then the market will be more balanced. Um, prices will be better. Gas will be more available. That's not a that's not a bad thing, I don't think, for suppliers, even though it's perhaps sometimes counterintuitive. Um, we want our product to be uh, used to be uh, considered favorably. Um, and and there have clearly been a lot of concerns through, through the last year in terms of availability and um, affordability. How much Russian supply there will be, I think, is, is kind of hard to estimate at the moment, as Tatiana said. I think there's quite a lot of Asian demand, so I'm pretty um, relaxed. I think Power of Siberia 2 will happen. I'm not sure how much of the LNG will happen, given the technical challenges, given the sanctions. Um, so with uh, the amount of Russian gas that goes into Asia, I don't think will create um, an impact on the amount of uh, US volumes that we see coming out over the longer term. There may be shorter term impacts, but, you know, the US uh, supply is very flexible and can ebb and flow between different marketplaces, which which means that it's able to accommodate shorter term uh, supply demand imbalances. Yeah, I would agree with Andrew uh, that actually uh, these additional volumes from Russia going uh, to non OECD Asia uh, means they are tar they most likely will be targeted to the markets with very low credit ratings, with uh, low prices, with high risks. So the markets, which anyway are not uh, the first choice of the, of the suppliers. And uh, Russia, as I've mentioned, most likely will be able uh, to provide a rather low fixed price. So I assume they will trade not on spot, but just uh, make uh, old uh, style long term contracts. And uh, especially if it is LNG to power, then it will be like contract for the electricity price, not even for LNG. Uh, so it's a bit different market, and uh, indeed, I don't think that there will be a lot of direct competition between Russian LNG and the US LNG, back to my point of fragmentation, that actually there will be uh, special segments in this market evolving with different rules, different pricing mechanisms, different insurance, different legal system even, most likely. Can I just can I just make one point on that though, Gergé? I think I think LNG is slightly different, say, from the oil market and the oil products market. There's less of a I'm not sure what to call it, grey grey trade in LNG, twilight trade. It's sort of there are very few LNG carriers that are available to kind of trade off right off radar off system. Virtually none, I imagine. So actually, it's I think it would be a lot harder to avoid scrutiny in terms of the owners, the ship owners, the traders. So I'm, I think it will be a very different outcome than we're seeing perhaps with some of the other commodities. Okay, well, um, thank you very much, uh, dear colleagues, for your excellent um, and very insightful presentations today and for this um, lively um, discussion. Now this brings us to the next part of of the of the workshop, which really focuses on the on the Asian market. And I would like now to invite um, 
the colleagues who are uh, speaking in the second part of the workshop to uh, turn on um, their screens uh, so um, so we can uh, introduce them. Um, so first, we will hear a presentation from my uh, colleague, Jan Takashiro, who is uh, one of our consultants uh, within the World Energy Outlook um, team. Um, then Mr. Hashimoto, senior fellow at the Energy Security Unit of the uh, of, of uh, the Institute of uh, Energy Economics of Japan will um, present on the energy supply security challenges of the Asia-Pacific region. Um, this will be followed um, by a presentation by uh, Mr. Sebastian Grieb uh, from uh, Total Energies, who will give us um, more perspective from, from a trader. Um, and then last but not least, uh, Mr. Madhi Rapta, the CEO of the Indian Gas Exchange, um, will present on how traded markets can enhance um, gas supply security. So with that, um, I would like to give the floor uh, to, to my uh, colleague, Jan uh, Takashiro. Jan, the floor is yours. Hello, oh, can you hear me well? Um, we can hear you and we can see you. Okay, thank you. And you, can you see my slide as well? We can see it very well. Yes, okay, thank you very much, uh, Gergay, for introducing me. And good morning, good afternoon, everyone uh, connecting from Asia and elsewhere. I'm Jun Takashiro, um, Senior Energy Analyst focusing on Asia in the World Energy Outlook team in the IEA. I'm in charge of the Southeast Asia Energy Outlook, which has longest history among IEA's all regional energy outlooks, uh, regularly published in every two or three years since 2013. IEA attaches a huge amount of importance to the relationship with Asia. So today it's great pleasure for me to join this comprehensive and uh, timely workshop on gas supply uh, security with uh, other distinguished speakers. I really enjoyed the half, uh, first half of the session. Uh, as has been pointed out in that session, over the past few years, we have witnessed a number of events affecting the gas, secu uh, gas supply security. Uh, in this regard, I would like to start my presentation by highlighting other structural changes that are essential when considering long-term gas supply security. So the first of these is clean energy technologies, and the first among them, solar PV and EVs. In 2020, EVs accounted for one in 25 car sales. This year, we expect it to be around one in five. The except, uh, exponential uh, growth in EVs is set to continue, reaching at least half of sales in the major markets of China, EU, and the US by 2030. Solar PV has become huge industry. Invested capital in global solar PV manufacturing is one quarter as much as invested capital in the global automobile manufacturing industry. Before 2030, solar PV and wind overtake coal to become the largest source of electricity generation globally. And by 2030, there will be more heat pumps and other electric heaters sold globally than fossil fuel boilers. The final force shaping the outlook is the slowdown and rebalancing in the Chinese economy. As the Chinese government pursues what it calls high quality development, the working age population has peaked and so has cement production, and steel production is at or close to the peak. We therefore see China's economic growth slowing down and rebalancing. The energy world in 2030 will look quite different from today. First, the number of EV cars on the road will have grown nearly 10 times, and the number of ice cars on the road will have peaked and be in decline. 
solar PV and wind will be the largest source of electricity generation. And there will be more heat pumps and other electric heaters sold globally than fossil fuel boilers. And instead of growing at break, breakneck speed, China's total energy demand will be slowly falling. Now let's look at what this means for energy, starting again with China. Between 2012 and 2022, China has been responsible for roughly a half of global energy demand growth, two thirds of global oil demand growth, one third of global gas demand growth, and China was by far the dominant player in global coal markets. China's growth has surprised the energy world once already, but now its economy and energy sector are changing. The energy sector should be ready for this or face a second surprise. As a result of this growth in renewable energy and nuclear power in the electricity sector, China's coal demand is set to peak in the next few years and decline, with EVs already accounting for nearly one third car sales. The number of icicles on the road in China will peak by 2030. This leads to a peak in China's oil demand these decades. And China's gas demand continues to grow across the following two decades, but more slowly than the past decades. Let's now uh, look at the advanced economies where energy demand has already structured as uh, saturated. The decline of coal demand is set to accelerate in the steps as the load of coal decommissioning increases from 20 gigawatt per year to 30 gigawatt per year in the coming decades. Oil demand in advanced economies peaked in 2005 and its decline becomes more pronounced in the coming decades. In the longer term, the growth of renewables in power and heat pumps in buildings start to make inroads in gas markets, uh, gas demand. So let's now look at emerging markets and developing economies other than China, where our trends are a little bit different. Coal demand continued to grow in the developing world outside of China, driven by countries such as India, with, with still large energy needs. Oil continues to grow up to 2050 with a growing population and weaker ownership in regions such as Southeast Asia and India. Natural gas demand is particularly driven by the Middle East, which will be the largest source of demand growth over the coming decades. By the early 2030s, per capita gas consumption in the Middle East is set to exceed that of the United States. Gas demand also grows strongly in Africa to support sectors like industry and fertilizer production. Combining these different regional trends leads to a peak for each of the fossil fuel by 2030 without additional climate policies in steps scenario. So now let's take a closer look at the natural gas demand. In all scenarios, gas demand peaks before 2030. However, you can immediately see the pace of the decline is largely dependent on progress in clean energy in the power sector, electrification of the industry and building sectors and growth in energy efficiency. Wind and solar play essential roles in reducing natural gas demand in the power sector. Leaving gas plants on the system is often necessary to support a renewable rich grid, especially to manage seasonal variabilities in demand. This requires an appropriate market design to remunerate balancing services. Then let's see regional uptrends. Natural gas demand declines in advanced economies in all scenarios again. Robust support for clean energy reduction uh, reduces the share of natural gas in energy supply by 2030 in the power sector and then increasingly in buildings. 
On the contrary, there is a wider range of possible outcomes for natural gas demand in emerging markets and developing economies, including Asia. Major differences emerged by 2030 at a time when, as uh, in the first session as a point pointed, a new LNG supplies are anticipated, keeping gas prices low and potentially stimulating robust demand growth. In the APS and energy scenario, this possibility is precluded by rapid growth of renewables in the power sector in all regions, which starts to reduce the market share of natural gas after 2030s. The so nuts, now let's take a look at today's main subject, natural gas demand in Asia. An increasing population and strong economic growth sustain this increase in natural gas consumption in emerging markets and developing economies in Asia over the next decades. Notably in industry, despite the near-term risks brought about by the recent supply squeeze. As prices come down from the mid-2020s, these markets see a big increase in natural gas use by 2030 as a result of coal to gas switching. And this helps countries with net zero emissions targets to rapidly transition away from coal. With a crowded outlook for the use of natural gas in transport, industry remains the anchor for demand growth and the focal point for large scale infrastructure investment in LNG import capacity storage and onshore transmission and distribution grids. Ultimately, however, the prospects for natural gas in emerging market and developing economies in Asia have a limited duration. Although the trajectory varies, demand peaks in all emerging gas markets in Asia before 2030 in APS and also steps. The share of of natural gas in the total in total power generation remains flat in the years ahead, but then falls to less than 5% by 2050 as other sources of power system flexibility drop in price and step into replace gas. So now, now let's move on to the supply side. In 2010, Emerging markets and developed economies in Asia were, in aggregate, net gas exporters. Flat or declining production in much mature gas fields in countries such as Indonesia and Malaysia, along with strong demand growth in China and India, brings gas import rose quickly to co cover 30% of total gas demand by 2022. And in the steps and APS, import dependence increases further to cover 40% by 2030 in this region. I'd like to see a deeper look at trade in LNG. In 2010, LNG trade was already a major global industry, largely governed by point-to-point -point contracts between exporters and importers. U.S. was among the importers. Fast forward to the last year, and we had an industry transformed, a much deeper and more liquid global energy market prompted by the rise of the U.S. as a major exporter. It was vital to ride out the stock of Russia's cuts to supply. The share of energy in Europe demand rose to 35%, similar to the contribution from piped gas from Russia before its invasion of Ukraine. But con gas consumers around the world were left with the bruises from a turbulent year. And for the moment, the conversation about gas remains dom dominated by fears over price spikes and the security of supply. But th that is set to change. Prospects that have started construction or 
taking a final investment decision are set to add 250 billion cubic meters per year of liquefaction capacity by 2030, equal to around 45% of today's global energy supply. Announced timelines suggest a particularly large increase between 2055 and 2027. More than half of the new projects are in the United States and Qatar. The strong increase in energy production capacity eases prices and gas supply concern, but Europe is not going to take more. Neither will the longest established market in Japan and Korea. So, the key consumers for this gas are in China and other emerging countries in Asia. Sorry, uh, can, can you see my screen? Um, yes, we can. Uh, we can see your screen, John. Something happened to my screen. It disappears. Sorry for the interruption. No worries. Uh, sorry, Gergay, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. We can hear you well. Uh, this place, uh, my display is turned off. Would you like me to share um, your slides? Hello, sorry for the technical problem. Hi, hello. Uh, can you my can you see my screen? Yes, we can we can see see the back now. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, something wrong happens. So uh, it starts again. Okay, so we talked about we yes construction of the new energy energy capacity. So um, so let me start. Uh, so who takes uh, the increase of energy capacity? So the key consumers is China and uh, Asia, Southeast, especially Southeast Asia and uh, uh, India in particular. Um, so promise, promises to be very strong competition among suppliers uh, for these markets, especially uh, if China growth is weaker than expected. So ample uh, supplies of LNG in the second half of the decade means uh, in our view, uh, very limited opportunities for Russia to secure additional markets in Asia. So Russia's share of internationally traded gas used to be 30%. Uh, this is uh, halved by 2030. So in this result, uh, global oil and gas trade is set to become increasingly concentrated on flows between the Middle East and Asia. In the steps, Shibon crude oil trade from the Middle East Asia rises from around 40% of total global net trade today to around 50% by 2050. Asia is also the final destination for three quarters of incremental Middle East air energy supply between 2022 and 2030. High reliance on single countries, companies, or trade route makes the system vulnerable to unexpected events, whether this relates to individual national policy choices, natural disasters, technolo uh, technological failures, or corporate decisions. These risks are inevitably heightened at times of geopolitical risks, as stresses. So fragmented approaches by gas producers and consumers could heighten energy security risks and geopolitical tensions during net zero transitions. Any mismatch in the pace of demand and supply reductions could cause, could cause very high and low prices, leading to turbulent and violate markets, a volatile market. Uncoordinated policy implementation could lead to overinvestment in new gas capacity or premature retirement of existing infrastructure. And either of these could undermine efforts to bring about secure energy transitions. A lack of cooperation could also hamper the development and 
smooth functioning of the complex values change that are needed for long scale trade in low emission fuels. Avoiding these pitfalls, we require country, con uh, countries and companies to work together. So as a closing part of my presentation, I would like to highlight that there are several ways for them uh, to do this. First, clear long-term plans on the part of major consuming countries and sectors would help producers to make informed infrastructure and capital investment decisions. Second, consumers and prosumers could addition, in addition explore joint investment to link clean energy supply with demand. Third, bilateral and multilateral dialogues could further improve mutual understanding of policy goals, help avoid potential disruptions and reduce the risks of standard uh, surrounded capital. So governments around the world have an uh, important part to play in facilitating coordinated and, and timely investment. And this means, in particular, setting closer policy frameworks uh, that are compatible across borders. So that's all for me. Sorry for the uh, inconvenience about technical issues, but thank you very much for your attention. Dear Jun, uh, many thanks for this um, very insightful presentation and giving us a glimpse on the future of um, of of the energy outlook of of Asia, which is, as you said, is is most dynamically um, developing um, region in terms of energy uh, demand, but also you know there, there is quite a significant uh, sub-regional um, differences which which have to be taken into consideration. Um, and with that, I would like to um, give the floor to Mr. Um, Hashimoto, um, who will um, discuss the energy supply security challenges um, in the Asia-Pacific region. Mr. Hashimoto, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Morda. Can you hear me? We can hear you well, and we can see you. Okay, thank you. And the uh, screen is okay. And we can see also your screen. It's all perfect. Okay. Okay. Uh, my name is Hiroshi Hashimoto. I belong to the Institute of Energy Economics Japan, one of the largest uh, energy think, ta think tanks of the world. And in fact, uh, before joining the institute, the institute, I worked for the International Energy Agency for four years. So it's uh, uh, like a uh, uh, coming home meeting today. Uh, thank you very much for including me. This is my storyline. I'm starting with uh, uh, factors affecting uh, LNG supply security in the Asia Pacific region, and then status of LNG market, uh, histor historical and current context uh, with a uh, uh, perspective from Asia and uh, consideration of future LNG production project. And I will touch on logistical issues uh, uh, that is very important for LNG transportation and uh, production uh, connection uh, between production and uh, consumers. Consumers, and for total, total LNG market stabilization, uh, stabilization, I have some issues uh, related to policy and role of IEJ, IEA here. Now, uh, elements that affect LNG supply security in the region. Uh, first, uh, supply sources. Uh, in the region, major gas consumers do not have uh, a lot of uh, their own sources or vicinity of uh, their market. Uh, there are not so many resources. So production and consumer cons consumption centers are not often connected by uh, big pipelines. Uh, with this, uh, diversification of supply sources uh, uh, have been uh, well developed because of uh, uh, different uh, procurement sources uh, from uh, big uh, consuming countries like Japan or Korea. And now uh, availability and affordability of supply uh, is not only uh, depending on uh, supply sources, but also we have to think about uh, demand fluctuation in other major consuming markets, uh, notably in recent years, the European Union is affecting uh, availability of supply. 
And uh, uh, in terms of transportation infrastructure, uh, bulk of uh, transportation is uh, uh, dependent on LNG, uh, marine transported LNG, than uh, big pipelines. So uh, LNG terminals have been developed. Uh, but in this region, uh, those terminals have been constructed, attached to major consuming centers, basically separated from uh, each other. Uh, rather than part of integrated infrastructure with trunk line transmission pipelines. The region does not have a lot of gas storage capacity. Uh, most countries uh, do not have them, and uh, uh, some countries have already uh, developed significant LNG storage tanks instead. Well-functioning market. Some experts say a uh, well-functioning market can provide security of supply. So uh, these uh, several years, the global LNG market has functioned well, uh, but this is unfavorable to Europe, Europe, but not necessarily so to some Asia-Pacific markets. Uh, also, flexibility of LNG contract, uh, most uh, notably regarding destination restrictions. Uh, flexibility is certainly increasing, but again, this is unfavorable to Europe, at least for the last two years. Historical context. This chart shows uh, major consuming and producing regions in the last 50 years. And uh, uh, Asia uh, always has uh, uh, dominated the uh, uh, consuming side. Uh, in 2011, Japan, China, Korea uh, were uh, the largest consumers. Now also uh, Japan, uh, China, Korea are also uh, the largest uh, consumers. And uh, more than half, uh, more than 60% of the global supply uh, coming to uh, those Asian markets. Now uh, we should also look at the uh, uh, global total market size of uh, uh, LNG and uh, uh, orange stock, orange stocks show the uh, volumes of LNG in million tons. And uh, uh, blue stacks show uh, market size in uh, money amount. So uh, in 2022, uh, significant price rise resulted in uh, significant growth, doubling the size of the uh, market in terms of uh, uh, economic value. Uh, to uh, more than uh, 430 billion US dollars. So this is a significant development. So a lot of market uh, paid uh, more than uh, more uh, money than previous years uh, for uh, smaller volumes. And this is to show the changes in uh, LNG import in major consuming countries uh, and regions uh, uh, in the first 10 months of the year. So uh, the top left shows uh, uh, importing side and the uh, top uh, uh, bottom left shows uh, uh, changes in exporting size. Uh, of course, we see, we saw some uh, significant growth in uh, LNG export from the United States, uh, but the consuming side. In 2022, uh, we saw some declines in LNG import in China and Japan and significant increase in uh, European LNG import. But uh, uh, compared to the, uh, to compared, uh, comparing uh, uh, the last two years, 2022 to 2023, uh, changes in LNG import have been modest in uh, this year. Uh, the world traded uh, 326 million tons in 10 months, uh, just, just uh, almost the same as uh, last year. Uh, so the, this is a rather uh, quiet uh, year for the LNG uh, market uh, changes. And uh, now uh, this, is, this uh, uh, top right uh, chart shows uh, uh, major uh, three major uh, LNG import markets, uh, monthly import. Uh, blue, blue stack shows uh, uh, European Union plus uh, United Kingdom and orange Japan and uh, gray China. So the uh, European uh, blocks uh, importing uh, more LNG than China and Japan. 
Now looking at uh, Southeast Asia and South Asia, uh, those are major uh, emerging markets, but uh, uh, we saw some uh, significant contrast uh, last year. Southeast Asia increased LNG imports, but uh, uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh combined decreased LNG import by 2.5 million tons. This year, we saw uh, newcomers, uh, Philippines, Hong Kong, and Vietnam have imported uh, fast LNG cargoes. So uh, significant changes are going on in this market. Um, Bangladesh and Pakistan uh, also reduced LNG imports significantly last year. Uh, they are showing some signs of a recovery of more import this year. Now, for uh, looking at the uh, global situation uh, on the uh, long-term basis, uh, previous speaker uh, mentioned uh, declining gas demand uh, in the long term, but uh, uh, this chart is based on uh, IEJ's own uh, outlook until 2050. Uh, we expect significant growth in LNG uh, trade volumes until 2050. So uh, those gray uh, stocks shows uh, uh, existing capacity, uh, taking into account of natural uh, decline of uh, capacity, production capacity, as well as recurrection capacity. And yellow stocks shows uh, uh, already uh, sanctioned uh, capacity. So uh, there may be some uh, uh, space uh, to increase LNG uh consumption uh in the global basis uh, uh, around 2030 but uh, uh, around 2050 we see some gaps between existing and uh, uh, expected uh, demand so we need more investment in energy project this table uh is to look at the uh, uh, production project development trend from 2010 uh, first, we uh, saw uh, significant concentration of LNG production project development in Australia, uh, leading to uh, some cost escalations. Then, uh, later half of 2010s, we uh, saw a significant shift of uh, project development activities to the United States. We are uh, now seeing some logistical constraints caused by uh, uh, pandemic as well as uh, uh, the war, uh, logistical issues are, are constraining some project development activities. But uh, uh, we are also seeing some innovations like floating LNG production or modular and design one and built many strategies uh, that could lead to some cost uh, reduction or con containment. And we are seeing uh, 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 escalation of cost of uh, basic uh, materials uh, that could also read, uh, contribute to the escalation of project development cost. And we are seeing some uh, 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 trend to make LNG projects cleaner, uh, including electric electrification as well as CCS. Uh, so the, uh, talking about uh, uh, greener LNG production project, electrification trend, uh, using uh, some greener power sources uh, uh, uh now uh, gaining momentum but uh, uh, it has its own challenges matching uh, uh, demand and supply of renewable power sources and as also uh, backing up uh, uh, intermittent nature of uh, renewables it will be the uh, challenge in the future for the ccs uh, there there's also a big trend of incorporating uh, ccs in energy project development uh, but also oh, this has uh, uh, challenges uh, like uh, suitable uh, location of, for CO2 storages as well as uh, uh, find, uh, finding synergies with other industrial uh, facilities. Uh, now looking at uh, current and major future energy supply sources, uh, considering uh, uh, supply potential to the Asian market, uh, United States is al uh, already big, uh, and uh, we expect more FIDs and project development activities uh, with increasing uh, commitment, off-day commitment. Uh, but it has challenges like uh, long distances from Gulf, Gulf of Mexico to Asia, and uh, uh, certain troubles at production facilities could uh, uh, disrupt uh, uh, supply, impacting uh, uh, 
situation, global situation, uh, significantly. Uh, because of a uh, uh, long distance from Gulf of Mexico, there may be some uh, uh, epoch-making uh, development in Canada, uh, opening up the west coast uh, of North America's major LNG supply source uh, will have significant impact. We uh, still expect Australia to be continue to be continue being a uh, uh, major supply source to the region, but we see some uh, uh, issues to be considered labor issues and climate policy issues, uh, which could affect uh, LNG project development. East Africa is expected to be a major source of LNG supply, and uh, uh, it, but it has some uh, challenges in uh, continuing uh, construction activities. Russia, in terms of, of Russia, uh, Saharin II is uh, in 2022, uh, in fact, is uh, was the largest uh, single uh, supply uh, project. Uh, uh, Australia has a lot of uh, LNG supply, but uh, they are coming. Uh, it is coming from different project. Uh, as a single project, starting to was the uh, uh, largest last year. In Qatar, we are uh, seeing uh, uh, major development activities and 21 million tons per year out of 48 has been sold to international partners and uh, very long-term uh, commitment and very long-term deals. Uh, so the still remaining volumes should be sold into the um, other market. Uh, so we expect uh, some deals in the future. Uh, LNG production activities, uh, uh, investment development activities are, uh, are now uh, gaining momentum uh, because of uh, a lot of long-term commitment in 2022 and 2023. And the uh, uh, United States as supply sources, uh, China, uh, Asia, Asia, Europe, and portfolio players as buyers represent uh, represent majority of term contract parties in 2022 and 20, uh, 2023. Turning to the Japanese market, uh, at this moment, uh, Japan imports around 70 million tons per year of LNG, uh, but uh, the contracted volumes are declining to towards the end of 2030s. Uh, so uh, we still expect significant demand uh, around 60 million tons per year around this time. So uh, uh, the question is how to uh, fill the gap uh, or between uh, the committed volumes and uh, expected demand. So we uh, we are expecting some uh, uh, different uh, procurement activities de de uh, depending on uh, portfolio players as well as short-term deals. Turning to the uh, logistical issues of LNG uh, project, uh, major uh, contributors to major contributor to the LNG trade between the United States and the Asian market uh, is uh, uh, expanded Panama Canal. So this ch this chart shows uh, uh, increasing uh, volumes of LNG and LPG from the Gulf of Mexico to the Asian market, uh, transiting through uh, Panama Canal. So this is a, a major factor uh, of increasing uh, uh, traded volumes of LNG. This chart shows the uh, uh, number of cargoes in bus and uh, uh, lines show uh, waiting time, time for uh, can Panama Canal transit. So the waiting time is uh, uh, increasing. Uh, this is due to uh, larger volumes to be transported as well as uh, uh, congestion. And recently, uh, drought conditions are, are constraining the uh, transit through the canal. So this should be, uh, this should find solutions. And also the larger transportation distances. This chart shows the uh, uh, transported distances, uh, Japan combined board, uh, average, as well as uh, uh, global average in, in blue. And now we are seeing, uh, uh, major volumes uh, from uh, the United States and uh, uh, especially to the Asian market, volumes from the United States travel a lot more than uh, global average. So this uh, is inevitably lead to the uh, need for uh, optimization of energy transportation. Turning to the uh, political uh, matters, uh, previous speakers, uh, one of the pre uh, 
yeah, Mr. Katahira uh, talked about the G7 uh, uh, summit uh, uh, development, uh, confirming the importance of LNG. And this, this table shows uh, uh, some uh, important clauses relating to uh, natural gas and LNG uh, from the uh, ministerial communique. And uh, it uh, also underwrites importance of natural gas. But particularly important is uh, uh, we need to establish, uh, the industry need to establish international standards of emission measurement and international cooperation are also important. So this is a, a significant point uh, uh, containing or mitigate, mitigating uh, emissions, uh, including methane. Now turning to the role of IEA, uh, this uh, table uh, compares the uh, uh, elements of uh, IEA's role in uh, oil security as well as natural gas uh, and LNG security. Mr. Morna mentions it, IEA's willingness to uh, support energy security by providing more information uh, transparent information. I agree with that, and uh, uh, it's important to uh, uh, enhance functions of uh, uh, provision of uh, market information, uh, including uh, non-IEA member countries, as well as the uh, uh, advisory function from the IEA should be important in the future. Now, this is the last slide. I I uh, I have uh, uh, five elements here uh, towards the long-term stability of the LNG market. Uh, now, uh, in the supply side, momentum is built, but stronger support is desirable to uh, make a project happen. And uh, demand issues, uh, shifting uh, the uh, shifting of uh, demand centers to the emerging market uh, will create opportunity uh, uh, to support. Uh, provide support from traditional energy consuming countries like Japan. And uh, it is also important uh, because of the flexibility of the market. Uh, it is good, but also uh, uh, LNG production project needs long-term commitment. So some forms of long-term commitment should be established uh, in different arrangement. Pricing, uh, appropriate balances between different pricing indexes. Uh, important uh, oil oil index or gas on gas index has uh, uh, some advantage and disadvantages. So appropriate combination should be important. Now climate issues, clarification of uh, clean or transition compatible LNG product standards should be established. Uh, financing is a uh, particularly important in the future because of uh, anticipated uh, increasing cost or uh, anticipated uh, expansion of the LNG market. Arrangement that can accommodate shorter LNG sale contracts. And uh, uh, this is all needed for both matured and emerging markets in the Asia Pacific region. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, and now I would like um, to give the floor um, to um, Mr. Madhi Ratta, the CEO of the Indian um, Gas Exchange. Mr. Madhi Ratta, good to see you. Um, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Molna. And uh, it was really great to hear all my previous speakers uh, from. Uh, uh, from Japan and uh, latest from Total, Mr. Sebastian. And what he said is very, very relevant. Uh, I agree fully with him that uh, Asian markets are having some peculiarities as compared to European and other markets. State-owned companies are actually uh, mostly doing the long-term contracts. And uh, they are not so dynamic in terms of uh, making market moves. And that we have seen uh, the issues and uh, challenges in creating a dynamic spot market uh, in India itself. So uh, uh, I would be talking about India. Uh, having heard from my previous speakers from global to Asia, 
and now we will be talking about the very small market as compared to global but of course uh, fastest emerging market uh, in asia uh, in terms of gas i'm not sure to what extent we will grow but we have ambition uh, today gas uh, is only 6% in the total energy mix in india but we have ambition to make it 15% uh, of course it's much less than global average of 25% and i think uh, east asian average of uh, maybe 40% uh, but of course we are different from other countries in terms like we we have very limited gas to power uh, opportunity our uh, size of gas being used for power sector is very limited and i'll just come to that point later in the slides so uh, greg you can move to next one uh, so i'll just uh, briefly talk about uh, what is the overall structure uh, in the indian market uh, in terms of infrastructure still that's growing we have 20000 km of uh, high low, big diameter pipeline we call it trunk pipeline and that is about uh, to go to 33000 km in two years time one year now we have a large number of lng terminals uh, uh, terminals already there so about uh, uh, six terminals are there and then we are we may grow to nine terminals and the capacity today is about 40 million ton expect to grow to 75 in uh, next three years so no no dearth of uh, import capacity we understand that we have limited gas uh, domestic gas play uh, so we have about uh, our total out of total consumption we consume 55% from domestic gas but of course at one time it was uh, uh, about two years or three years back it was about 45% in last three years there has been growth in uh domestic gas production so we have now 55% and 45% is imports but uh, we expect that in uh, after few years we our domestic production will plateau and uh, later whatever expansion is going to take place that will be met only through imports so for that reason lng terminals are uh, we have planned a lot of energy ter lng terminals and they we expect the all of them to be uh, commissioned in terms of uh, domestic gas production uh, today we are about 35 later we'll go to 45 but beyond 45 we have a limited play uh, we don't see a large play beyond that so whatever else we need that will come, that will have to, uh, have to come from import and uh, another major thing which uh, we have taken initiative is uh, expanding our uh, city gas distribution uh, so far there was a limited play in city gas uh, uh, large part of the country was not uh, served through pipelines and network uh, for households industries and uh, uh, for uh, uh, industry uh, and and uh, transport but now uh, in last uh, two years or three years a lot of licenses have been issued so almost 98% population today is covered through licenses and we are going to do another set of uh, another round of licensing um, in next 3 to 4 months and that will cover the 100% of the country in terms of uh, uh, city gas uh, uh, coverage but otherwise uh, all of our power plants gas based power plants uh, uh the fertilizer plants and few of course refineries they were covered under city this uh, uh, trunk routes uh, but all of them uh, today uh, uh, maybe in next two years uh, even uh, all refineries will be connected through pipeline network petrochemical plants will be connected through pipeline network and of course egd companies so we uh, you can see that a lot of dotted lines on the eastern side and uh, our uh, 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 southern side but all of those dotted lines will be fully uh, commissioned in next 2 to 3 years so we are hopeful that uh, whatever we, whatever in infrastructure we require for growth of this market uh, we will have in next 2 to 3 years 
Greg, uh, maybe next next slide. In terms of uh, gas consumption, uh, our gas consumption is largely fertilizer plants that use for as a feedstock, gas as a feedstock. And that segment is uh, actually not price sensitive. So that uh, actually takes care of a lot of growth. Even when there was uh, high prices uh, last year in 2022, but uh, this sector has continued to grow and uh, uh, most of this uh, LNG imports were done by fertilizer segment. But unfortunately, uh, power sector, which otherwise is a major contributor to gas demand, is not the case in India. We, our, uh, we have over 25 gigawatt of capacity, which is uh, used only 20% of the time. The reason is that uh, coal is our major uh, power uh, producing uh, fuel. Uh, besides, now renewables are coming up. Uh, we have very ambitious plan for uh, putting up uh, renewable plants. So uh, besides that, uh, so coal uh, still is expected to grow and maybe that will peak by 2030. After that, uh, they will stabilize and uh, later, and maybe in later part of the this decade, we will have more uh, uh, power being produced from gas. So we are hopeful that uh, more gas will flow to power sector, mm, given that when peaking, we'll need some capacity. When you have high renewables, your peak demand still will be left with some fossil fuel generation. That time, uh, that will become uh, possible. Second uh, important element, which uh, is going to ramp up demand uh, in the, uh, maybe after 2026 will be lower prices. Because since uh, we have coal dominating the uh, power sector, the power prices uh, is uh, lower. And when we use uh, imported gas for uh, producing power, then cost is more and that, uh, that doesn't fit in the merit order dispatch uh, used by the power sector. So transition is expected to increase the uh, utilization of gas. Uh, and uh, a lot of degrowth happened in the last two years, but now we expect the power sector will take up more uh, uh, gas. On the city gas side, transport and household demand uh, is uh, uh, met from domestic gas because domestic gas prices are uh, artificially uh, regulated. Uh, by through some formula and then uh, uh, that's not uh, using the free market gas so that gets the cheapest gas in the system and cheapest gas is uh, the domestic gas and uh, but only thing is this has got very large potential this uh, particular segment uh, will become very important as we grow we, we go in uh, by 2030 uh, which is currently the city gas is consuming something like uh, 30 mm CMD. Maybe by 2030, we expect it to consume 150 mm CMD. So five times growth is likely to happen in this sector. Other sectors like refinery, petrochem, other industries which use it as fuel, they all are very price sensitive and they have alternate fuels uh, which uh, they uh, switch to whenever prices go above $15. So last year, there was a lot of degrowth, switching happened. This year also, since it is not coming down below $10, so still there are few industries still using the other fuels, but uh, we expect uh, uh, as we go along, there will be uh, higher utilization of gas with the cheaper gas available. And as we have seen in all our previous uh, uh, sessions that uh, globally gas uh, supplies will improve and prices are going to soften and further soften below 10 below ten dollar then probably we will see a major uh, growth is expected uh, will happen in uh, indian gas demand uh, molar next one so our gas markets are basically lng imports about 45% again there is a long term market and uh, long-term market uh, has got both. Uh, we generally get long-term uh, gas from Qatar, US, and Australia. And uh, contracts are linked to uh, mostly oil. Uh, and then uh, JKM link contracts are also there. Uh, 
for spot uh, lng uh, we have uh, gas uh, coming linked with uh, jkm and vim both and uh, all of these uh, gas are freely tradable only thing is we have not seen i am not aware if uh, mr sebastian is uh, aware that we have any contract which is linked to ttf uh, we don't have any as i understand there is no gas uh, which is uh, either long term or uh, spot which generally uh, gets linked with uh, european gas indices on the domestic uh, 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 gas we have uh, 55% is the total uh, uh, contribution from domestic gas and about 30% of that is administered price uh, gas which is uh, uh, whose price is regulated and it's not freely tradable it is uh, allocated by government but uh, other gas which is uh, one is difficult high pressure high temperature gas there uh, it's a uh, tradable it's uh, it has got market freedom but only thing is uh, it has got a, a limited resale margin and this this also uh, actually uh, has got some priority for uh, ctt power plants and uh, fertilizer plants but otherwise uh, the other part other part of domestic gas which is very small maybe about 20% uh, that has got uh, totally free market gas mostly it is cbm or discovered small field gas which is really marketable and uh, there is no ceiling price on that and they can be sold uh, without any limitation uh, uh, we'll go to the next one uh, so if, within all of this situ uh, parameters and uh, structure and market conditions we started our transparent marketplace a indian gas exchange about 2 years back in uh, december 20 and of course we are going to complete 3 years in uh, like by next month and uh, there uh, this is uh, basically physical spot market we have uh, gas hubs created uh, uh, at different uh, locations where or delivery points where uh, the gas production is happening or uh, the lng imports are coming so lng terminal and mostly domestic gas fields they are the locations for our delivery points and since our transmission pricing is still not uh, uh, is contractually uh, linked to contractual path and distance based so for that reason we need to identify them as a physical delivery points and we have contracts which are available for up to 6 months a monthly fortnightly uh, weekly and daily but largely our transactions happen on monthly basis but they are all physical contracts and uh, the uh, delivery is also taken care by exchange and settlement is also done through exchange so it's a pure delivery based market uh, go to next this is these have been uh, the prices discovered on the exchange so they are uh, as we'll see in the next slide uh, these prices are very closer to very close to uh, the international spot prices uh, because we have a mix of gas which is traded on the exchange so well, some part of uh, gas is uh, imports and some part is uh, domestic pure free market gas and some part is the resale of Uh, uh difficult gas which is uh, having some kind of uh, uh capping so all of them put together we discover a price of gas uh, of the uh, within the within the indian borders is go to next so these have been uh, the 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 trend of uh, our prices uh, our price we are calling it as a jixi this is also now we uh, broadcast it as index and this is called as gas exchange gas index of india and if you see this red uh, uh, curve you can see that uh, generally this is at discount to uh, jkm and uh, uh, vim which is international spot uh, price uh, in japan korea market and then another vim is uh, our west india market which is published by plats and uh, only thing is this discount uh, we, you may see that when the prices were very high discount was much more as prices are generally uh, in the range of 10 to 20 dollar 
the discount is much lower. So they are linked with the international spot prices, but they have their own discounting because uh, of uh, other gas which is being sold in the market. Next one. Uh, these have been our overall, uh, you can say, liquidity parameter. We may not call ourselves a very well-functioning market, but of course, in terms of uh, period of two to three years, uh, we have grown uh, sufficiently well, and we are hopeful that uh, better liquidity will happen. Of course, for a few more liquidity measures uh, we need from the government and regulator. Uh, so we have about 200 plus uh, uh, participants and uh, we did a trade of uh, 1.3 BCM last uh, financial year. And uh, this year also we have grown uh, in terms of volumes as compared to last year. Yeah, please, next. I'm sorry that we are using in this slide uh, terms which are more uh, of Indian, uh, uh, for Indian audience because lakhs, crores and Probably that's not very, uh, you won't be able to get uh, anything out of it. Uh, but uh, just telling you, the numbers like 10 lakh is equal to 1 million. So normally in India, for Indian audience, we use lakh and crores. So Jixi, uh, so, the, so I'm coming to the, uh, the last few slides where uh, what uh, uh, the topic was like how this uh, uh, marketplace has... Uh, uh, allowed uh, or uh, created a gas security for the uh, for the country. So I will tell you that uh, as uh, Sebastian said that uh, before 15 years, most of the markets were not transparent. Same thing was there in India even two years before. Uh, whatever you used to buy, only those prices were visible. Uh, whatever we used to import, they these are generally available on the public domain, but. Uh, Otherwise, there was no way to know that what is the transparent price getting discovered or uh, what is the competitive price for uh, gas. So big uh, thing we got uh, on platform is, uh, since this is the index which uh, we are discovering, and we discovered this price index uh, from uh, getting sellers of uh, domestic gas, long-term contracts, spot contracts, mid-term contracts, all of them put together. So that gives a quite a good mix of uh, sale volume. And then we discover this price. So basically when we discover a price, as any economist would agree that uh, these price signals, which are transparent, they uh, really give direction. They give, uh, they, they, they are actually very useful for uh, sectors. So those sectors who value this commodity most, uh, the gas uh, must flow to them. Uh, the, there are more incentives now today because when they see prices are good, they are we they 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 see incentives for increasing the production, and they also are ready to sell uh, more gas, uh, uh, which is market based uh, discovered through market based uh, mechanism. Uh, then, uh, of course, when the cost is prices more, then they look for some uh, cheaper fuels, though they are dirtier. That is the particular uh, customer uh, customer uh, behavior that we expect to happen, and that is uh, happening. Uh, another thing which now we see that uh, since uh, last year we saw that uh, prices have fluctuated a lot, so uh, there is no underground gas storage in India today. So now there's a discussion started uh, to uh, uh, commission a few strategic and commercial reserves for uh, gas storages. Uh, uh, and then uh, if you see that uh, the, there's another thing which has happened in the Indian market is that uh, we are seeing the shift from uh, short-term contracts to long-term. Uh, so long versus spot, which was earlier uh, 70, 30, or maybe uh, now it is going to 80, 20, something like that, uh, because people are afraid to uh, get exposed to very high spot prices. Uh, investment signals and new capacities are anyway there. Uh, we also see that since we have our delivery points or hubs uh, in different parts of the country, so uh, people use the arbitrage opportunities for uh, going to different hubs, uh, looking at the 
transmission and taxation, which is different for different states. We also see higher churn in trade, as uh, Sebastian said that uh, cargo itself actually changes hands uh, more than 10 times. Uh, in India, we also have seen that uh, gas titles are changing hands now more, uh, being exchange being there, and the most competitive gas actually flows finally to the customer. And then there is an opportunity today for cross-border trade because exchange is there, market pace is there. Bangladesh is one of the biggest uh, uh, gas user. They have 60% of gas uh, part of their energy consumption. We are hopeful that uh, they also will participate. They, we have started the dialogue. Uh, we expect uh, maybe in, in, in a year or two, they would also be participating uh, using the same market platform. Yeah, we'll go to next. I think this is all what I thought I will uh, share. I will stop here. And uh, many thanks for kind attention. Thank you. Um, dear Mr. Marirata, many thanks for um, this very insightful presentation. So I would like to um, thank you, all the um, attendees um, today, because the workshop on gas supply security is coming to an end uh, today. and um, Many, many thanks uh, for all our speakers uh, for the excellent and insightful uh, presentations. Um, we say that following the gas supply shock of 2022, the architecture of global gas supply security and the flexibility needs to be reassessed both by policymakers and uh, market players. This new global gas market um, is taking shape and is bringing up new challenges, new question marks, which necessitate a closer cooperation between responsible producers and consumers on a number of issues, including the reduction of methane emissions, commercial structures enabling more flexible energy supply, and gas storage, including voluntary reserve mechanisms. I would like to thank you Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs for its dedicated support for such a dialogue and for enabling today's workshop. Today's workshop focused on Asia and its fast-growing markets where natural gas is closely linked to policies aiming to phase out coal-fired power generation. Ensuring gas supply security will be crucial to accelerate the phase out of coal in the coming years. And the IEA stands ready and to facilitate the dialogue between producers, consumers by providing data analysis, special insights, and also using the task force on gas and clean fuels, market monitoring and supply security as an effective platform for information sharing. I would like to thank you for your kind attention today, and we look forward um, for your comments, questions, and future interactions. Many thanks and have a good day. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.